In Boston, political radicals encouraged the acts that lead to the revolution. And 13 divided, ill-prepared colonies reluctantly joined forces to battle the most powerful nation on earth. Passion governs, and she never governs wisely. The colonies are not to be emancipated. All men are created to victory or death. American rebels were fighting British regulars at the Battle of Bunker Hill. The Continental Congress was in session here at Philadelphia's Independence Hall, formerly Pennsylvania State House. John Adams believed he had the key to enticing an equivocal Congress into supporting the army that had formed around Boston. And the key was a man. I concluded with a motion that Congress would adopt the army at Cambridge and appoint a general. I had no hesitation to declare that I had but one gentleman in mind for that important command. And that was a gentleman from Virginia, John Adams. The gentleman was George Washington, who had attended the convention wearing his scarlet and blue Virginia militia uniform, as if advertising his availability for military service. With one brilliant stroke, John Adams brought the Plantation Society Southern Colonies to the active support of the industry-oriented northern colonies, and at the same time, provided the embryonic Continental Army with a strong, charismatic leader. He was the revolution. He was the army. He is the only American who's ever lived who, if he had chosen to, could have become king. There was a movement toward the end of the revolution to make him the king of the new country. Though I am truly sensible of the high honor done me in this appointment, yet I feel great distress from a consciousness that my abilities and military experience may not be equal to the extensive and important trust. However, as the Congress desire, I will enter upon the momentous duty and exert every power I possess in their service and for the support of the glorious cause. George Washington to the Continental Congress. He was a man who had presence. He just walked into a room and everyone stopped and looked at him. He was very tall for, the, for that day, about six feet three, but in that time that made him a giant. George Washington was one of the richest men in America. He owned thousands and thousands of acres in Virginia, which he had in part acquired when he married Martha Custis, who was the richest widow in Virginia at the time uh, of their marriage. And he had inherited a very substantial estate from his brother Lawrence at Mount Vernon. And also he owned thousands of acres in the West, which he had acquired as bounties for his service in the French and Indian War. And it only proves, I think, that the American Revolution was unique in this respect. It wasn't in any sense an attempt to overturn the existing class structure. It was really a war fought to protect rights and privileges and property which Americans felt they possessed as uh, free-born Englishmen. 
At his Mount Vernon home, Washington presided over an estate that sheltered and utilized the labors of over 300 hired workers and slaves. He was a tough character. He, he, he wasn't this old man on a dollar bill that we think of now. He stood as straight as an Indian, you know, and men just worshipped him. He drank and he liked to gamble and play cards, and he could, when he got mad, he could cuss the paint off the walls. You have prepared me to entertain a favorable opinion of him, but I thought the one half was not told me. Dignity with ease and complacency, the gentleman and the soldier look agreeably blended in him. Modesty marks every line and feature in his face. Abigail Adams on meeting George Washington. Everyone said he was extraordinarily graceful, the best horseman of the day. He was powerful. He inherited his father's strength. He didn't speak a lot. He was very self-effacing for two reasons. One, that was just his personality. He was not a, a pushy person. The other is his teeth were very bad. Even as a young man, they were rotting out. And that always embarrassed him a little, so he kept his mouth shut. You see the paintings of him with his lips clenched together. My dearest, I am now set down to write you on a subject that fills me with inexpressible concern. It has been determined in Congress that the whole army raised for the defense of the American cause shall be put under my care and that it is necessary for me to proceed immediately to Boston to take up command of it. George Washington to his wife, Martha. Two weeks after the Battle of Bunker Hill, Washington rode to Cambridge and officially took command of the Continental Army. He kept the British trapped in Boston and its harbor for months, while he watched his new army, largely composed of independent and undisciplined state militiamen, dwindle by desertions and enlistment expirations. Such a dearth of public spirit and want of virtue, such a dirty mercenary spirit pervades the whole that I should not at all be surprised at any disaster that may happen. Could I have foreseen what I have and am likely to experience? No consideration upon earth should have induced me to accept this command. George Washington, October 29th, 1775. Nevertheless, enough old militia re-enlisted and enough new militia appeared in the next months to hold the shoestring army together. Washington moved his forces onto the heights of the Dorchester Peninsula, where he could overlook the British, but he could not threaten them. He had no heavy artillery. You can't begin to imagine the first three years of the war, 1775, 76, 77, without thinking of the two great heroes, the two men who, between them, kept that war alive, George Washington and Benedict Arnold. Both were great warriors. Both were magnificent motivators of soldiers. Both had physical courage on the battlefield. Both did great things. Benedict Arnold is one of the great enigmas in American history. The reason his treason was so traumatic is because he was such a great hero. In May of 1775, Benedict Arnold, a successful Connecticut merchant whose name is now synonymous with traitor, had a plan that would supply the Patriots with the cannon and munitions they desperately needed. Far up the Hudson River, on the southern end of Lake Champlain lay a dilapidated, undermanned British fort from the French and Indian War, known as Ticonderoga. Arnold persuaded the Massachusetts Committee of Safety to allow him to take up to 400 men to Ticonderoga with the intent of capturing it and its scores of heavy cannon. On the way to do this, he discovered that Ethan Allen was going there on his own so he went ahead, just himself and one person, and joined Ethan Allen. Ethan Allen was a frontier giant and vigilante who commanded the hills of Vermont with his Green Mountain Boys. Hartford, Connecticut citizens commissioned him and his cohorts as the perfect guerrilla force to take the fort. 
Arnold and Allen didn't get along at all. They fought. They, they didn't like each other personally. They disagreed over who was in charge. And it was confusing. To take Ticonderoga, as it turned out, was a piece of cake. The British defending it hadn't heard about the fighting in Lexington and Concord. So except for one guard, they were all asleep. By the time the alarm was spread, the Americans were inside the fort. They had, uh, at Bayonet Point, all the British, and they surrendered it. No loss at all. The fort was now in American hands, but the transport of the cannon to Boston would require the vision and perseverance of a 280-pound Boston bookseller, Henry Knox. Although he had gained his knowledge of weapons entirely from books, Washington was enough impressed with his mind to make him commander of artillery. I have made 42 exceeding strong sleds and have provided 80 yokes of oxen to draw them. I hope in 16 or 17 days' time to present Your Excellency a noble train of artillery. Henry Knox to Washington. In a legendary feat, the fat bookseller dragged more than 50 cannon through wintry New England mountains to their destination in Boston. Now Washington had his big guns. Once Washington got his hands on these cannon from Fort Ticonderoga, he was ready to act. And in the dark of the night, he emplaced a substantial number of them on the Dorchester Peninsula. And the British awoke one morning, and they stared up, and here were these guns ready to fire right down their throats. The rebels have done more in one night than my whole army could do in months. General William Howe, upon viewing Dorchester Heights. In mid-March, 1776, less than two weeks after the guns of Ticonderoga appeared atop Dorchester Heights, the British set sail for Halifax, Nova Scotia, taking a thousand Boston loyalists with them. And the Americans then celebrated this as a stupendous victory, which it wasn't. It was a completely illusory victory. They didn't kill a single British soldier. They did get Boston back. But the whole British army had gotten away to fight another day, and they did indeed come back and fight another day as a great, great, big British army. Because 13 colonies became independent, there's a sort of sense of inevitability as though the modern United States was an actual unit. Actually, what really happened was the partition of British America. Um, the rebels expected that their future state would include not merely the 13 colonies, but also Canada, Newfoundland, Labrador, and the West Indies. With the allegiance of 13 colonies, the rebels decided in late 1775 to try for a 14th, Canada, the frozen giant to the north. In September of 1775, General George Washington commissioned one of the heroes of Ticonderoga, Benedict Arnold, to travel to Canada through Maine with 1,100 troops and take the fortress city of Quebec. You are entrusted with the command of the utmost consequence to the liberties of America. Upon your conduct and courage, and that of the officers and soldiers detached on this expedition, not only the success of the present enterprise and your own honor, but the safety and welfare of the whole continent may depend. George Washington. Arnold would be part of a two-pronged attack. General Philip Schuyler and General Richard Montgomery would lead a force of 1,200 men from Fort Ticonderoga to Montreal, then push down the St. Lawrence to meet Arnold at Quebec. Though Montgomery's approach would prove to be difficult and dangerous, Arnold's march through the Maine wilderness would be epic. They sailed to the mouth of Maine's Kennebec River from a port near Boston. This was the true start of the 385-mile wilderness trek to Quebec. Arnold's march to Quebec is truly one of those great dramas of the revolution. 
It, it has to go down in history as one of the great feats of leadership on one hand and the overcoming of tremendous obstacles and, and the, the willingness to accept great privation and pain, even starvation on the part of the people who went along with him. They pushed up the Kennebec in rough 200-pound bateaus, which had to be portaged around the river's many waterfalls. You would have taken the men for amphibious animals, as they were a great part of the time underwater. Benedict Arnold. Breaking trail for Arnold was Daniel Morgan, portrayed here as an old man. At the time of the trek, he was in fact a 39-year-old, tough, wily frontier giant who had lost all the teeth on one side of his mouth when an Indian bullet passed through his neck 17 years earlier. Morgan commanded three companies of riflemen for Arnold's expedition. By the end of October, the northern winter was upon them, and their supplies had run out. The voracious disposition many of us had now arrived at rendered almost anything admissible. In the company was a poor dog who became a prey for the sustenance of the assassinators. This poor animal was instantly devoured without leaving any vestige of the sacrifice. Nor did the shaving soap, lip salve, leather of their shoes, cartridge boxes, etc. share any better fate. Dr. Isaac Center. Half of them or more didn't make it. They died along the way of disease or starvation or they gave up and went back. The others struggled on past the headwaters of the Kennebec toward Canada's Chaudière River. They wade through the mire to the foot of the next steep and gaze up at its summit, contemplating what they must suffer before they reach it. They attempt it, catching at every twig and shrub they can lay hold of. Their feet fly from them. They fall down to rise no more. Private George Morrison. But for Arnold's own personal leadership and his own endurance, uh, they may not have made it. As this entire group was about to freeze to death, to, to die of exposure, he and a few hand-picked men raced on ahead, uh, got into the French settlements on the Canadian side, got food, and returned it to the men. I have been deceived by every account of our route which is longer and has been attended by a thousand difficulties I never apprehended. But if crowned with success, I shall think it but trifling. Benedict Arnold. Revitalized by the food, Arnold and his men marched on to the imposing cliffs of Point Levy, across the St. Lawrence River from the city of Quebec. really was a, a river, the St. Lawrence, and two cities, Montreal and Quebec. The second prong of the American attack on Canada had captured the smaller, less important city of Montreal. Ironically, this feat may have prevented Arnold from taking Quebec, the key to Canada. The day before he would have launched his attack, with scarecrows, but still a stronger force than the British had. British troops escaping from Montreal, which had been captured, came into the citadel, and that made the garrison too strong for Arnold to take. That was the point at which the fate of modern Canada was settled. If the Americans had captured Quebec, it's most unlikely they would ever have been dislodged. Arnold bided his time. The second prong, now under Montgomery, reached Quebec three weeks later. The two commanders decided to wait for a blizzard and launch a sneak attack on the fortress city at night. They got their chance on New Year's Eve, 1775. 
Arnold would come from the north. Montgomery would approach from the south, around the precipice of Cape Diamond, where massive chunks of ice would cause his men to proceed in single file. Montgomery led the way. Men of New York, you will not fear to follow where your general leads. Come on, my brave boys, and Quebec is ours. General Richard Montgomery. A cannon firing small lead balls called grape shot ripped the darkness. Montgomery, two of his captains, a sergeant and a private were killed on the spot. Confused and discouraged, his troops retreated. Arnold and his force of 600 passed through the palace gate into the winding streets of Quebec's lower town. They were surrounded by British musket fire. Arnold was hit. A musket ball lodged in his left leg. The loss of blood rendered me very weak. As soon as the main body came up, I returned to the hospital. Near a mile, on foot, being obliged to draw one leg after me. And a great part of the way under the constant fire of the enemy. Benedict Arnold. The command of the American forces now fell to Daniel Morgan. Through daring and fierce fighting, he took hundreds of prisoners. But after three hours of fighting, Morgan was still unaware of Montgomery's death. Finally, without Montgomery's troops, Morgan was forced to surrender. The battle for Quebec was over. From a hospital bed on the outskirts of the walled city, a dogged Benedict Arnold lay with pistols loaded and sword at his side. I have no thought of leaving this proud town until I first enter it in triumph. I am in the way of my duty and know no fear. Benedict Arnold. We came that close, the Americans came that close to making Canada the 14th colony. And if they had, it would have been Arnold's doing. Upon his return to Philadelphia from England in May of 1775, Benjamin Franklin found the signs of war all about him. He devoted himself to the work of the Patriot cause. Benjamin Franklin was a very unlikely revolutionary. He was 70 years of age in 1776. Uh, an unusual age for a revolutionary. One doesn't usually think of men that old risking everything. He already had an international reputation, which none of the other revolutionaries had. And uh, everything to lose, and, and what could he have gained? But he throws himself into it uh, with the passion, his anger at the British government for humiliating him in 1774 led him to his patriot enthusiasm. At the same time, the rift between the old revolutionary and his loyalist son, William, continued to deepen. Franklin and his son, the governor, spent a whole night discussing the prospects of the revolution and emptying many bottles of Madeira in the process. It was Franklin's favorite drink. Franklin could not change his son's loyalty to England. The crown had given him respectability, and the son said that he would not espouse the revolution, that he was a servant of England, and thus he would remain. After this, the two men did not talk anymore until after the revolution. As governor of New Jersey, William Franklin became a loyalist leader. His revolutionary father became a member of a select five-man committee responsible for drafting one of the most significant documents ever written. The Declaration of Independence is, without doubt, the most important uh, document in, in, in the Revolution and perhaps uh, in American history because it sets forth the ideals uh, under which the, the United States lives. It, 
it's the one thing that holds us together, the, the belief in that all men are created equal. Now, of course, all persons are created equal and that all of us have certain inalienable rights. Those ideals, those aspirations are the adhesive that hold us as a diverse people. Many of the rebel leaders were reluctant to declare independence. In July of 1775, the American Congress even sent a conciliatory proposal directly to George III. John Adams dubbed it the Olive Branch Petition. But the English king refused to receive it and instead sent to America a belligerent proclamation. Whereas many of our subjects in diverse parts of our colonies and plantations in North America, misled by dangerous and ill-designing men and forgetting the allegiance which they owe to the power that has protected and supported them, have at length proceeded to open and avow rebellion. We do accordingly strictly charge and command our officers and all others, our obedient and loyal subjects, to use their utmost endeavors to withstand and suppress such rebellion. George III, August 23rd, 1775. The king was convinced, as most of his subjects were, that it was essential to retain control of the American colonies. And he proceeded to the bitter end to believe that, and bitterly opposed even the making of peace at the end. Indeed, there's a domino theory. If you let America go, everything else will fall. Canada will fall, the West Indian colonies will fall, and so on. Thomas Paine was an Englishman who had come to America through the sponsorship of Benjamin Franklin. Early in 1776, he wrote an enormously successful piece of propaganda called Common Sense, the first major public call for independence. In months, the 47-page pamphlet had sold 100,000 copies. O oh, ye that love mankind, ye that oppose not only the tyranny, but the tyrant, stand forth. Every spot on the world is overrun with oppression. Freedom has been hunted round the globe. Oh, receive the fugitive and prepare in time an asylum for mankind. Thomas Paine, 1776. Forward-thinking Abigail Adams saw in the climate of change a rare opportunity for her own sex. I long to hear that you have declared an independency. And by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose it'll be necessary for you to make, I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could be. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice. Abigail Adams, letter to John Adams, March 31st, 1776. Finally, the Congress created a committee to put America's demands for independence into writing. A 33-year-old Virginian, Thomas Jefferson, accepted the task of authorship. In Williamsburg, weeks before his new assignment, Jefferson had written the preamble to Virginia's Constitution. He would use it to guide him in his current task. He rented the upstairs flat of this house in Philadelphia to do his work, and in the parlor, at a small desk, he wrote the Declaration of Independence. It was intended to be an expression of the American mind, and to give to that expression the proper tone and spirit called for by the occasion. Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson believed Franklin should have written the Declaration, but the world-wise old diplomat shied away from such things. I have made it a rule, whenever in my power, to avoid becoming the draftsman of papers to be reviewed by a public body. 
Benjamin Franklin. Instead, Franklin tinkered with Jefferson's text. We hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable became we hold these truths to be self-evident. The greatest tinkering, though, came from the Congress itself, in session at the Philadelphia State House. Jefferson's original draft contained a passionate condemnation of the slave trade. Jefferson was a slaveholder who hated slavery. He wanted to abolish it. He moved at various times in the state legislature of Virginia in the Continental Congress to uh, try to make inroads against this institution. But of course he himself was always a slaveholder and was never able to free more than a half dozen or so of his own slaves, which numbered at one point around 200. So that inconsistency uh, nodded him throughout his whole life. Jefferson's declaration was approved on July 4th, 1776, only after the condemnation of the slave trade was deleted. How is it that we hear the loudest yelps for liberty among the drivers of Negroes? Samuel Johnson, English writer. For Benjamin Franklin, the day of independence was bitter with personal loss. On July 4, 1776, troops came in and led William Franklin away from his governor's mansion and took him to jail to Litchfield, Connecticut, where he stayed for about two years. Franklin did absolutely nothing to help his son. He did not interfere. He did not say a word. He let it happen. Although he believed the declaration would be adopted two days earlier, John Adams was uncannily prophetic about its reception. The second day of July, 1776, will be the most memorable epoch in the history of America. I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, with shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations from one end of the continent to the other, from this time forward forevermore. John Adams. Even if the Congress didn't seem to remember the ladies, Abigail Adams was swept up in the euphoria of a new beginning. The bells rang, the cannon were discharged, and every face appeared joyful. After dinner, the King's arms were taken down from the State House, and every vestige of him from every place, and burned. Thus ends royal authority in this state, and all the people shall say, Amen. Abigail Adams on a reading of the Declaration at the State House in Boston. On July 9th, Washington had the Declaration read to his troops. He and his men now had an actual League of States to defend. Also on July 9th, in New York, the Sons of Liberty toppled the lead statue of George III. They melted it down and cast 42,000 Patriot bullets. I am well aware of the toil and blood and treasure that it will cost us to maintain this declaration and support and defend these states. Yet through all the gloom, I can see the rays of ravishing light and glory. I can see that the end is more than worth all the means and that posterity will triumph in that day's transaction. John Adams. After Washington and his cobbled together army chased the British from Boston out of the 13 colonies to Halifax, Nova Scotia, Congress was elated. 
The self-appointed legislators saw the British as easily defeated foes. They were wrong. The British were not kidding around anymore. They were raising men, they were raising millions of dollars, they were floating uh, ships out of dry docks where they'd been sitting since the Seven Years' War, and uh, they were getting ready for an immense effort. And they did indeed put together the largest British army they had ever sent overseas in the history of the country. William Howe's 9,000 men from Halifax would meet with his brother, Admiral Richard Howe's 23,000 troops from England, in the harbor of one of the largest cities in America, New York. New York of, of 1776 was a, a city of 25,000 people. The city itself uh, was a very busy seaport and uh, a very prosperous city. It was almost all on the lower end of Manhattan Island. New York was really the key to the continent. It had this magnificent harbor that was ice-free almost the whole uh, winter. Anybody who had New York was in a very good position to win the war. And the British could see that. So could Washington. Anticipating Howe's move, Washington marched the Boston Army to New York to join forces already there. By mid-year, he stood ready to meet any British advance with 23,000 men, almost two-thirds of them untrained state militia. The battles around New York really were a series of uh, disasters for the Americans. It was just one defeat after another, retreat after another. And of course the militia proved to be totally undependable and not only they wouldn't fight but they went home in droves by the thousands these guys just uh, didn't feel the slightest uh, need to stay nobody was going to shoot them or uh, you know court martial them or anything they just picked up their guns and went home when we see washington in new york we see him reaping the bitter fruits of the lies that the americans told about lexington and concord the idea that the simple farmers could leap from their fields and defeat these British regulars had more or less blocked Washington's proposal to the Continental Congress that he raise an army of 40,000 men for the duration of the war. No, 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 the Continental Congress said to Washington. You can't have a big regular army. All you need is a relatively small regular army, and they can only serve for one year, because that's all a virtuous American can be expected to sign away as liberty for. Among those short-term recruits was lanky 15-year-old Joseph Plum Martin from Milford, Connecticut. But his six-month enlistment would turn into six years he would see action in many of the major battles of the war. I have here an 1830 first printing of Joseph Plum Martin's book, which he called A Narrative of Some of the Adventures, Dangers, and Sufferings of a Revolutionary Soldier, written by himself. Martin, when he wrote the book, was a 70-year-old veteran of the whole of the revolution. He is incredibly accurate. He's given us the only complete autobiography of a continental soldier. Martin first snuffed a little gunpowder, as he phrased it, at the Battle of Long Island, when the British finally attacked and routed the Americans at Brooklyn Heights. We soon landed at Brooklyn, upon the island. We now began to meet the wounded men, some with broken arms, some with broken legs, some with broken heads. Joseph Plum Martin. With Joseph Plum Martin's first battle also came his first taste of defeat. Multitudes were drowned and suffocated in morasses. A proper punishment for all rebels. The island is ours and we shall soon take New York, for the rebels dare not look us in the face. 
I expect the affair will be over this campaign. And we shall all return covered with American laurels. And have the cream of American lands allotted us for our services. A British officer after the Battle of Long Island. Unwisely, Washington had divided his army between Long Island and the island of Manhattan. With the British fleet in control of the harbor, nearly 10,000 of his troops now found themselves trapped on Long Island. The revolution survived when they made their escape thanks to the seafaring skill of John Glover and his marble headers. Washington got them all down in boats run by a group of his soldiers who were from Marblehead, Massachusetts, who understood water and sea and shipping, and under cover of darkness, got his entire army from Brooklyn back across to Manhattan. When the British woke up the next morning, they looked out, and the American lines were empty. That was the loss of the first and greatest opportunity to destroy Washington and his army. Overpowered on the land and on the water, the Americans tried a secret weapon, David Bushnell's Turtle, the world's first submarine. It could submerge for a half hour, and Benjamin Franklin gave Bushnell the idea to illuminate the dials down in the darkness under the water with fox fire. So the guy had a compass down there and he had a general idea of where he was going. With a detachable time bomb at the tip of the submarine, Bushnell's pilot set out to destroy the British fleet. However, the attack was a complete failure, and a second attempt was never made. For two weeks, Howe refused to move on the Americans on Manhattan Island. Instead, he conducted peace talks at this home on Staten Island with Continental Congress representatives Benjamin Franklin and John Adams. During the peace conference, Franklin and John Adams shared a room. And it turned out that Franklin, who was a great fan of fresh air, wanted the window open. And Adams wanted the window closed. And they debated this for a long time. And Adams said that while Franklin was explaining to him the virtues of fresh air, he fell asleep. On Staten Island, Adams and Franklin were no better making peace with the British than they were making peace with each other. The talks broke down, and Howe moved again against Washington's army. This time, his troops came ashore at Kipps Bay on Manhattan. The Connecticut militia saw this, this armada of ships coming towards them, and as they got out of the boats with their bayonets ready, they just took off. They ran right by Washington at 42nd Street, and he just, he couldn't believe his eyes. And he threw his hat on the ground, and he said, are these the men I'm supposed to defend America with? Routed at Kipps Bay, Washington's army made their next stand in the naturally defensive terrain of Harlem Heights on northern Manhattan Island. When the British sighted the Americans, they sounded the call used by successful fox hunters. This humiliation may have prompted the Americans into their most successful engagement in New York, a draw. Such is my situation, that if I were to wish the bitterest curse to an enemy on this side of the grave, I should put him in my stead with my feelings. George Washington. Howe finally chased Washington north out of New York City and up to the village of White Plains. Here at the end of October, Washington would meet the British again. But the real damage would take place at Forts Washington and Lee, twin encampments on the Hudson designed to keep the British from sailing up the broad, vital river. While he's up in White Plains, Howe draws almost all his army back to Fort Washington and he executes this absolute masterpiece of an assault on Fort Washington. They bombarded it from all sides, and they just, in a half hour, they utterly and totally demolished the American defenses, and 
the whole 3,000 men and all these precious cannon, over 100 cannon, surrendered. Four days later, General Charles Cornwallis, with 4,000 men in flatboats, attacked Fort Lee, high up on the Hudson Palisades. The Americans escaped this time, but the fort and all of its stores fell into British hands. No man, I believe, ever had a greater choice of difficulties and less means to extricate himself from them. George Washington. By the end of 1776, New York, its harbor, and the vital Hudson River belonged to the British. With Washington's army shriveled to a few thousand men, American hopes were never fainter. In December, common sense author Thomas Paine wrote another brilliant piece of propaganda entitled, The American Crisis. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of his country. But he that stands it now deserves the thanks of man and woman. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the trial. Namaste.